First Peter chapter 4. And uh, while you're turning there, I just want to thank you for praying for us last week. We weren't here because our youngest daughter got married, and uh, what a wonderful day that was. Actually, it was several days. Um, we had a full house. I think we had 15 people staying at our house one night or two nights. So it's a crazy time, but it was a wonderful time. So, uh, But it's good to be back. Okay. First Peter chapter 4, we're going to be looking at verses um, 7 through 11. Peter writes, The end of all things is near. Therefore, be clear-minded and self-controlled so that you can pray. Above all, love each other deeply because love covers a multitude of sins. Offer hospitality to one another without grumbling. Each one should use whatever gift he has received to serve others, faithfully administrating God's grace in its various forms. If anyone speaks, he should do so as one speaking the very words of God. If anyone serves, he should do it with the strength God provides, so that in all things God may be praised through Jesus Christ. To him be the glory and the power forever. Amen. Father, thank you for your word today. Thank you, Lord, that we can gather freely to worship you and to declare your worth. We thank you, Lord, that we can come and place ourselves under your word and say, Lord, we are your followers, your disciples. We desire, Lord, to be instructed in how we are to live. And so, Lord, open our hearts, open our minds, open our understandings, that we might hear and receive what you're saying to us today by your Spirit. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Last week, uh, Pastor Ed spoke about certain declarations that we are as followers of Jesus. He said, we are new creations in Christ. When we come to Christ, we're we're made new. We are born again of the Spirit of God. We're a new creation. He said we are ambassadors. He said that um, we are God's masterpieces. Certain declarations. These are not suggestions. These are not things that we wish would happen. This is who we are in Christ. And uh, if we are to live our life on purpose, we need to understand who we are. We need to understand our identity. If not, we will be looking to try to find out who we are and, uh, and we'll miss out on the purposes of God. I want to add one more declaration. We are missional. Now, missional is a new word. It's been coined. It's a word that tries to capture what it means for the people of God to be sent by God to accomplish his purposes in the world. We are sent out by God as his missionaries with a message of reconciliation and with a task of making disciples. You know, as ambassadors, we represent a different kingdom. Any ambassador goes, he represents the kingdom that he came from. And we go out, we represent the kingdom of God. It's a new way of living, a different order of life, a whole new perspective of thinking. We go with an awesome message that says God wants to be reconciled with every person on the face of the earth. Now, we know that's not going to happen. We know that there are going to be people who say, yeah, God may want to be reconciled with me, but I don't want to be reconciled with him. You know, we carry the message. We say that God cares about people. God wants to know people. He wants people to turn to him. Very, very, very simple message. You can have a relationship with God. You can be forgiven of your rebellion no matter what it is because of what Jesus did upon the cross. You can be healed in your life. You can be healed of, of wounds and relationships. You can be healed of things on the inside that no one else sees. Certainly we can be healed physically. As Melanie was telling me earlier, she's saying, this will pass. And, uh, you know, there is hope in Jesus. And that's a simple message. 
I appreciated communion today. Because communion today brings us back down to what is essential. That our relationship with Jesus is built not upon us seeking him, but upon him seeking us. Because Jesus said, I came into the world to seek and to save those who were lost. And I don't know about you, but I was lost in my life. I was without direction. I didn't, I didn't know God. I didn't know who I was. I was insecure. Um, let me tell you how insecure I was. When I was in, I was in seventh and eighth grade, um, I thought, maybe I'll be a lawyer. Until I found out you had to speak in front of people, I said, nah, I'm not going to do that because I don't like speaking in front of people. You know, God can change your life. And we're here today because God has changed us. He's changing us. And we go through all the things that we go through because God is proving himself faithful in our lives. That is our message. It's a message of saying, you can come home to the Lord. To everyone who is out there, you can come home. Well, you don't know what I've done. You can come home. That's the message of reconciliation. And Jesus um, uh, purchased our salvation on the cross. Now, there's a, a very funny, there's several funny commercials out there, but there's a funny commercial put on by, I think it's a Capital One Bank with a Visa card, and they have all these commercials. And, and the catchphrase they have is, what's in your wallet? And of course, they want you to have their card in your wallet, but what's in your wallet? Well, I thought about the message today, and, and if we are going to be missional, if we're going to be missionaries for God, and we're going out and we're looking and saying, well, yeah, no, well, um, we'll let someone else do that. We need to know, what are we taking with us? What's in our wallet? You see, Jesus, early on in his ministry, he had disciples who were following him. He called 12 and named them apostles, which means sent ones. And then he had 70 other disciples who were following him. At two different times, he sent them out, two by two, to go ahead of him. Luke 10, I think, talks about that. You know, you know the story. And they went out two by two into the villages that Jesus was going to uh, go to. And he said, go out with a simple message. Declare that the kingdom of God is here. Heal the sick. Cast out demons. Raise the dead. Simple stuff. And he says, when you go... Don't take anything with you. He says, don't take your suitcases. Don't pack for weeks. Go. God's going to provide. They had to bring the essential thing. The essential thing is they went in the power of Jesus. They went with the message that he gave them. And they came back and they said, my goodness, it worked. The sick were healed. People received. You know, Demons were subject to your authority. And, and people's lives were changed as they went out. And you know, and this, these, these were disciples in training. They hadn't been with Jesus that long. So it would be like saying, okay, you've been coming to church for six months. We're going to send you out two by two. Go out. Whoa, 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 wait a second. I haven't finished Jesus 101 yet. <laughs> they hadn't finished Jesus 101 they went out with what they knew. They gave what they had received. They had something in their wallet. It wasn't a lot, but whatever they had in their wallet was sufficient. The same thing is true with us. And so we want to ask the same question as we consider what it means to go out in the mission field with God. What has he put in our lives? What's in our wallet? The word for the week is Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10. It's in your bulletin, and I just want you to listen as I read it again. It says, For we are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. I want you to think about that verse. Let's just pick it apart for a moment. We are God's workmanship. That word literally means masterpiece. It means that you, you were handcrafted by God. Think about that. Megan, you are handcrafted by God. You were handcrafted. 
Stephen, you are handcrafted by God. Haley, you are handcrafted by God. Every single one of us were. It says in Psalm 139 that we were knit together by God's hands in our mother's womb. And if we understand how DNA replicates itself, it looks like it's being knit together. Do you know that you are a masterpiece in God's eyes? I know that challenges us, but it's true. I wish I was taller. I'm not. God made me the height that I am. Some of you might say, I wish I had blonde hair. I wish I was this. I wish I was that. God made you just the way you are. You were born just at the right time that you, he wanted you born. You are his masterpiece. That is an awesome thought. He says that you were created in Christ Jesus to do good works. Now, we know that our good works don't save us. It's only the work of Christ on the cross. But we are saved in order to serve God. And the things that we do, <coughs> excuse me, the things that we do um, for the Lord are considered good works, righteous works, things that please God. And we were saved unto them. We were created uniquely and specifically. And yeah, we can look at our lives and say, yeah, yeah well. I may have been made a masterpiece, but I messed it up. You know, sin in my life really messed it up. I'll tell you what, God is at work restoring us. Our sin is not greater than God's grace. Our sin can never, ever stop God from working his purposes in and through our lives. Never, ever. Think about the people in the New Testament that God called. He called Paul to be the writer of half the New Testament. And what did Paul do? He went around killing Christians in his earlier life. Hello? And Paul struggled with that. That's why he said, I'm the least of the apostles. I'm at the end of the parade. I'm not even worthy. I don't know why God saved me. And I'm sure he's dealing with his own issues in his life, but he understood who he was in Christ. Same thing is true with us. We may look at our lives and we say, yeah, I messed it up, but God's unmessing your mess up. That's the truth of the gospel. He restores, he heals, he makes whole that which the enemy seeks to destroy. So we were created by God specifically on purpose, just who we are, our personalities, our gifts, our talents, um, our looks, everything, in order that we might Walk in the good works he prepared beforehand. Now, did he predetermine that? In other words, is there a specific date and a specific task that I have to do? And if I, if I sleep in, sorry you missed it? No, I don't think so. I think God has a specific plan and purpose in the earth. He's got specific things that he's working out. And this verse says <clears throat> he's invited us to partner with him, to join him. He's invited us to be on his team. And if we're on his team, we have a, a role to play and a part to play, and he has gifted us specifically for that part. We need to discover how God's gifted us and what that part is. But we are on his team. We are empowered to participate in God's good work. Okay, are you with me? Now I ask you a question. <clears throat> if God created you just the way you are, on purpose, if God has good works that he's prepared in advance for you to walk. In other words, he's already determined your role in his working out of his mission and purpose in the earth, and he's, and he's uh, called you to that. Do you think that God is going to give you what you need to fulfill that role? Now, in other words, if God called me to play in the Patriots, linebacker, do you think he would gift me with a body that would survive being on the line? <laughs> Hello? God is not cruel. And so if he's called you to be on mission with him, to go out those doors and to serve him and to make a difference in the world, <coughs> then he's gifted you for that specific role. It's logic. It's true. 
Now, we may not understand how he's gifted us. We need to discover that. We may not understand fully the role that we are called to play, but that will unfold itself as we step out in faith. But God has called every single one of us to be a missionary for him. He's created us. He's gifted us. He's given us the personality, the talents, the abilities that we have so that we might be able to play the specific role that we have on his team. And his team is gathered here, at least in part. Uh, let's turn back to 1 Peter chapter 4. I want to look at this passage. And my message today is very, very simple. In 1 Peter chapter 4, we see Peter writing some exhortations. He says, the end of all things is near. We don't fully understand what he is thinking. Maybe he's thinking that the Lord's return is coming coming soon. Certainly, um, our life is limited. And so we can look at that and say, the end of all things is near. In other words, we need to live our lives in light of what eternity is what God is doing in the earth, and and not lose ourselves in the minutia of life. Do you know the things that worry us the most are the things that are most inconsequential a lot of times? Think about it. Things that will never make the grade in terms of passing from from this temporal earth into eternity, those are the things that we worry about the most. That's what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 6. He says, why do you worry about what you're going to eat, what you're going to drink? Where are you going to stay? Where are you going to live? You say, well, those things are important. He said, no, seek first the kingdom of God, and God will provide everything that you need. And yet we worry about that, don't we? And he said, no, trust, God can supply your needs. And the things that we worry about the most are temporal, and then they crowd out the eternal, the essential things. And Peter is saying, no, The end of all things is near. Be clear-minded. Be focused. Be sober-minded. Don't get lost in 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 the weeds of life. But look at that which is most important. He goes on and he says, be self-controlled. Love deeply. Love the Lord deeply. Love one another deeply. Do you know it takes special focus to be able to love other people deeply? Because oftentimes we don't love other people. We're so concerned about ourselves and our situations. But that when you begin to give yourself to loving somebody else, it changes your whole perspective and focus. Offer hospitality. We are to be the most hospitable people on the face of the earth because Jesus has welcomed us into his family and onto his team. And so we can offer hospitality. It's an attitude that we carry with us. We want to, you know, be open to caring for other people. And then he says, use whatever gift God has given you. He says, each of you, use that gift you have received to serve others. Faithfully administrating God's grace in its many, many, many forms. Faithfully administrating God's grace. What does that mean? How do we administer God's grace? I always thought God's grace was something that was administered to me. And when we look at the word grace in the Bible, grace has several different meanings. They're related. The word grace literally means gift. So if you have a birthday and someone gives you a gift, they're showing you grace. It means free gift. And we know that uh, Ephesians chapter 2, verses uh, 8 and 9 says that we have been saved by grace through faith. That's not of ourselves that no man can boast, but it's God's doing. And so the grace of Jesus Christ means that when he died upon the cross, he paid the penalty for our sin. It's a free gift. We can't earn it. We can't do anything for it. We receive it. That's the grace for salvation. But you know there's a grace for life. 
that God says there's a grace that rests upon every single one of us. It has many, many different forms, or as Peter says here, it's multicolored. It's got a variety of different colors. Some translations say, uh, you know, various forms would be multicolored. And, and the grace for life, a grace beyond just simply saving us, forgiving our sin. Paul in, in 2 Corinthians was talking about the thorn in his flesh. Remember, we don't quite know what that is, but he says there's a, a messenger from Satan that's come. It's a thorn in my flesh. I've asked God several times to take it away. And God's answer to him was 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 9, where he says, my grace is sufficient for you. My grace is sufficient. It's a grace for life. We go through life and and we're struggling with things. We're wondering, why did this happen? And how am I going to do this? And we go to God and we say, Lord, Lord, take this away from me. And sometimes God says, no, my grace is sufficient for you. I will bring you through. My presence can empower you in that situation. My grace is sufficient. It's always sufficient. God's grace will never let you down. It'll never dry out. It'll never wear out. It's always there. It's always present. God's grace is sufficient. In Hebrews chapter 4, listen as I read this verse, dealing with the grace of life. He says, we find ourselves in difficult situations. He says, we have a high priest named Jesus who's gone beyond the veil. Uh, We can hold on to him and we can go to him. And it says in verse 16, let us then approach the throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. So when we go through difficult times, we can rely upon God's grace. It says that we can come before his throne because his throne is founded upon grace. It's He wants to save people. And when we come before him, we can make our requests known and we can find mercy before God. He extends the scepter. And we can obtain grace that's sufficient to meet our need. Whatever that need is, there is God's grace available. Now let me define grace. Grace in this case is God's grace presence in your life that empowers you. It's God's empowering presence. When we go on mission, when we talk to people who don't know Jesus, when we are at our jobs and when we are shopping in the store, when we were walking down the street in our neighborhood and we encounter someone and we're having a casual conversation, ask God for grace to understand what he is doing in their life. And you may find that he wants you to administer his grace through your life to them. We've got to be aware of that. It's his power. It's his presence. It's not us. But we need to be available. Peter says in chapter, 1 Peter chapter 4, he says that we each have received a gift And we can faithfully administer that gift to others. Now, I look at that, and and I like things simple, so this is what I get out of this. You are a gift to somebody else. You are a gift to somebody else. Because you carry the presence of Jesus. He's doing a work in your life. You get to take what you've received from him and give it to somebody else. You are a gift to your family. You are a gift to your neighbors, to your co-workers. You are a gift to somebody else. And Peter says that (coughs) we administer God's grace through our lives. Now, he's got a picture that he's working here. In the the Greek, the, the, the language suggests that as pure light goes through a prism, and you know what happens when light goes through a prism, it breaks into a rainbow of colors. And you know, when you look at a rainbow, there's not just seven colors. There's a, an, an infinite number of colors present in a rainbow. It's a continuous color. 
when you look, you know, red into yellow, you get oranges in there and so forth. And God says that his pure uh, light, the light of his nature in his presence that's invisible, that no one can see, will shine down through our lives. And it, it'll, it'll shine through Timber's life. And it goes through Timber's life. It's going to be uh, redirected and it's going to come out in a unique form of the grace that God has given Timber. And he can share that with somebody else. It's going to come out as wisdom. It's going to come out as, as concern and counsel. And people are going to be ministered to because of what? God has placed in Timber's life. And they're going to be able to see God's grace in action. And they're going to see God's grace, God's free gift coming toward them. And that grace is both for the body of believers as well as for the multitude who don't know Jesus. That's the picture Peter has in 1 Peter 4, verse 10. We get to distribute We get to demonstrate and to show the grace of God in our lives to other people simply by letting God's light shine in us and through us through the unique personality and the gifts that he's given us. And so when we go out on mission, we're not going out just by ourselves. We're not going out simply with our book learning. We're not going out with our good looks. We're not trying to attract people to have them come to church. We want to minister in Jesus' name the things that he has given to us. We get to give to someone else. And if he hasn't given it to you, you can't give it away. If it's not in your wallet, it's not yours to give. But God has placed things in our wallet. And every single one of us are unique. And though we all don't express the fullness of God's grace. Together we do. Together we do. Are you kind of catching what Peter is trying to say? The good works that we are called to do is basically ministering in Jesus' name out of the abundance he's placed in our lives as we look for people who have needs. Can you think of anyone who doesn't have any needs? Everyone's got needs. Acceptance issues. Controlling substances that are controlling their lives. Fears. Whatever it is, we can say God's grace is sufficient and we can minister. There's a big debate that's been going on about the nature of the church probably more in the academic world, is the church an institution or is the church a community of people? Well, it's both. But the debate is over where does it lie? Is the church more an institution? Do we run ourselves with very hierarchical structure? And, uh, and you know, if we do, then our, our ability to minister and our significance is, is founded in the offices or positions that we hold, right? And uh, so Pastor Ed, man, he's the key guy here. You know, he's the lead man. He's the one. He's in the office. If we look at it that way, then a church can devolve into becoming more of a business than anything else. Now, obviously, we're not functioning that way. We look more as a church, as a community of people, as a family of God. And if you look at it more in that sense, in an organic sense, the way Jesus talked about it, he says the church is the body, you know, um, it's living, it's, 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 you know, life is messy. The church is a vine, it's a, it's a tree, um, you know, uh, <clears throat> we look at it in that sense, it's more organic. And if we look at ourselves as the community, as the family of God, then our significance is seen not in the positions that we hold, but through the functioning of our gifts. Think about that. The functioning of the gifts that God placed within us is the most important. That's why Paul said in in 1 Corinthians 12 when he talked about the church being a body. He said, can you... Are you willing to sacrifice one part of your body as being insignificant? 
Can the hand say to the foot, I don't need you? Can the eye say to the mouth, I don't need you? No, the whole body is needed. And if you don't think that's true, let's cut off your little toe. Yeah, yeah, it was a, no, 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 no. <laughs> the minute you cut off my little toe, I know <laughs> it hurts. Uh, but, you know, that's who we are. And every single gift is important. There is no hierarchy of giftings. And we see ourselves as a team, as a, as a community of people, and we are different, and we focus different, and we think different, and we, and we act differently, and that's okay. Because if we were all the same, man, we, we'd be both bored and mad at each other <laughs> all at the same time. I, I want to close just by sharing with you just two illustrations to talk about how God uses us in our giftings in terms of his mission. One is taken from a book written by, it's a, it's a novel written by Randy Elkhorn called Safely Home. I read it a number of years ago. And it's a story about two men who were roommates at Harvard as they were getting their PhDs. One was the Chinese national, and the other one was an American. And after Harvard, their lives, um, you know, um, went different ways. They didn't really keep that much in touch with each other a little bit. The, the man who was the Chinese national became a Christian in, in, in Harvard while he was in the United States, went back to China and grew in Christ. The other guy was a nominal Christian and kind of fell away. He happened to go to China, the, the American businessman happened to go to China, where he met up, he was there in business, where he met up with his friend. And his friend had a PhD, he could be running the government in China. He was living in his hometown, a little hometown, and he was a locksmith. This guy was flabbergasted. You have a PhD from Harvard, what are you doing acting as a locksmith in this little village? He said, no, 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 you don't understand. He says, God gave me this job, but that's not my calling. He says, I'm the pastor of the house church that's hidden underground in this village. And God gave me the job of being locksmith because I can go around with reason to every single house working on their locks, and I can visit my congregation. It wasn't position. It was gifting. It was calling. So we can look and we say, well, gee, you know, what am I? I just, I just do this or I do that. No, 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 no. What's the calling of God upon your life? Who has God called you to influence? Who can you touch with the life of Jesus in you? The other illustration is very simple. Patriots, when they won the Super Bowl this past February, who won the Super Bowl for the Patriots? The team. Did Butler win the Super Bowl? No, he didn't score any points. Did Brady win the Super Bowl? Not by himself. The whole team won the Super Bowl. Could Butler's interception in the end zone secured the game for them if they had not had all the touchdowns prior to that? Of course not. And all the touchdowns prior to that wouldn't have meant nothing unless Butler stepped up and fulfilled his function on the team. He had one play. He read it, saw it right, stepped up, boom. And they celebrated him, but Brady got the MVP. Right? Same thing is true with us. There are going to be times where people are going to say, they've got a play to make for the kingdom of God. And we're going to go, whoa, look what God just did through this person. Hallelujah, we rejoice. Because I want to see God win. I want to see people put their trust in Jesus. We look at it, a whole community out there who have got up this morning, and the last thing on their mind was not, where am I going to go to church? But probably, where am I going to go to breakfast? And if they don't have an encounter with Jesus, then their eternity is doomed. And 
We have the message of reconciliation. We are the ones that God is empowered with his presence to go out. We are the recipients of his grace. And we're going to learn what it means to minister. But I want you in your own life, in your own heart right now to say, God, I don't know, understand fully what it means, but I'm here. Send me. I'm here. Use me. Lord, I may be, my knees may be shaking. I may not know what I'm going to say, but God, I'm going to trust that your grace is sufficient for me. I'm going to trust what you have placed in my life because I've got you in my wallet. I've got your gifts in my life. I've got your grace. Amen? Let's uh, let's pray together. Jesus, I pray that you would would minister the truth of your word to our lives. and, And Lord, I've sought to share what you've placed upon my heart. But Holy Spirit, we ask that you would help us to receive your word and work it so far into our lives that it changes the way we see things. We thank you, Lord, for saving our lives. We thank you, Lord, for your grace, for your presence, for the gift that you have placed in our lives, which is your Holy Spirit. We thank you for every ability We thank you, Lord, that there are supernatural gifts that are resident within every single one of us. Some of them may be lying dormant. Lord, stir them. Let us understand what they are and and how we are to, to use them for your glory. I thank you, Lord, that we are masterpieces of yours. We've been created in Christ Jesus for good works. Lord, we pray that you would help us to see ourselves separate from the sin that seeks to entangle us. See yourselves separate from the things the enemy has done in our lives, even when we weren't aware of what he was doing, where he sought to sideline us. Father, make us trophies of your grace. And I pray for anyone who may be struggling today, Lord, that that you would reveal yourself that you would give you word that would bring encouragement, Lord, that you would touch lives today. We thank you that we belong to you. As we read in Psalm 135, we are your treasured possession. Thank you for that. And Lord, we ask your blessing to